Hello and welcome to today's lesson on redshift, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQAA level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at the method of using redshift to understand astronomical distances. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to understand the Doppler effect, detail examples of redshift found in astrophysics, and understand and apply the formulae for redshift from observations. So we're going to be looking at the following part of the AQAA level physics specification 3.9.3.1 the Doppler effect so all electromagnetic waves have a frequency and a wavelength this allows for physicists to measure these quantities now the motion of either an observer or an emitter changes the wavelength and frequency of the wave detected now this is called the Doppler effect and is shown in everyday life by a siren on a passing vehicle now the Doppler effect is an observational effect it only changes the observed properties of the wave not its actual properties so the Doppler effect is caused by the relative motion between the observer and the emitter of radiation. Now this causes the observed frequency and wavelength of the wave to be altered. Now what we can see is in the previous example that the motion of either the observer or the emitter changes the wavelength and frequency of the wave detected. So consider a motorbike moving towards you emitting a sound. Now as you move closer, the space between the emitter and the observer decreases, this pushes the wavelength together. So it means the frequency gets bigger, yet the wavelength gets smaller. Now, if there's no change between the emitter on, or the observer, then there's no difference in the wavelength or the frequency. So there is no Doppler effect. And if you move further away, then the space between the emitter and the observer increases. This spreads the wave out. The frequency gets lower, so the wavelength gets bigger. So the Doppler effect is when the wavelength and frequency of a wave is altered by the relative movement of either their source or the observer. When the source or observer is receding, the wavelength is longer than it should be and the frequency is lower. When the source or observer is moving towards the other, the wavelength is shorter than it should be and the frequency is higher. So now, any wave experiences this phenomena of the Doppler effect. This includes visible light. Now, humans experience the wavelength and frequency of visible light waves as color. Now, a long wavelength visible light is interpreted as red. A short wavelength visible light is interpreted as blue. So you can see the comparison of color and, and wavelength of visible light in the following image. Red gives you a long wavelength and blue gives you a short wavelength. So now, if we consider the previous example in terms of light, as, the, as an object is moving towards you, the space between the emitter and the observer decreases. This compresses the wave together. This means the frequency gets bigger, the wavelength gets smaller, the light appears bluer. Now, if there's no change between the observer or emitter, there's no difference in wavelength or frequency. There is no change of color to in the, of light in the perception of the observer. If you move further apart, then the space between the emitter and the observer increases. This spreads the wave out. The frequency gets lower. The wavelength gets bigger, the light appears redder to the perception of the observer. So redshift is the Doppler effect for light. As light is a wave, it also experiences the Doppler effect if either an observer or an emission source are in relative motion. If the emitter and observer are moving further apart, the wavelength is longer and the frequency is shorter, so it is redder to humans. If two sources are moving closer together, the wavelength is shorter and the frequency is longer, so it appears bluer to humans. So this means when we observe observe distant objects, if an object is moving towards an observer, it will appear bluer than the object observer expects. If an object is moving away from the observer, it appears redder than the observer expects. So it's a very important idea to understand. Now, we can see the following idea in this particular example. It can be determined that if a star is red shifting or blue shifting by comparing the spectral lines of emission with a known source and seeing if they are different to the emission spectral lines of the distant object. This occurs as the absorption spectra of an element is the same regardless of the motion, location or temperature in the universe. So normally we use light produced in, in a stationary earth based experiment in the lab or light produced in the sun as a comparison for distant galaxies. Now we can use lab based samples of projected composition of stellar objects to observe the effect of redshift or blue shift but this is only an estimation. Now redshift can be easily determined by looking to see if there's a change in reference points in 
the absorption spectra of distant galaxies, compared to the absorption spectra of a stationary sample of matter in the lab. Now, the most common reference line uh, to look is the Balmer lines, the visible absorption lines of hydrogen, as hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. So if you can look in here, you can see that hydrogen has their Balmer lines. You can compare to see what it would look like in a lab sample compared to an observed supernova spectrum. Now, we can calculate the amount of redshift a galaxy exhibits, Z, and then use this to calculate how fast it's moving away or towards us with the equation Z equals the change in wavelength over wavelength equals the change in frequency over frequency equals the speed of the object divided by the speed of light. Now, this only works when V is a lot less than C. So the speed of the galaxy is a lot less than the speed of light. Now, you are given these equations in your examination, but you've got to be able to use these equations correctly and you've got to be able to equate the different equations of redshift. Now, Z is a quantitative measure of the redshift effect. It has no units. It's just a ratio. It could be considered to be the absolute change in wavelength, but only the approximate change in frequency due to relativistic effects. Now, if Z is positive, this means redshift is occurring. If Z is negative, it means the object is blue shifting. Now, Z can also be a measure of time since the light takes time to reach us. So Z equals zero indicates present time. Now, the highest redshift recorded is due to the cosmic microwave background, where Z equals 1089, and the highest Z value for a galaxy is 11.1. Now, we can look at a question uh, using the equations in the following example. In a laboratory sample, the hydrogen alpha spectral line is at a wavelength of 656.258 nanometers. In the spectrum from a nearby star, this line is observed at a wavelength of 656.315 nanometers. How fast is this star moving and in which direction? Well, firstly, the wavelength of the star is longer than it should be, so the star is moving away. So you work out your change in wavelength, then you say the change in wavelength over wavelength equals V over C. You then rearrange it and make V the subject by saying V equals C times by the change in lambda over lambda. Now, as this change in lambda over lambda is a ratio, there's no need to change the nanometers into meters as the units will cancel through. We then work out our answer is 13700 meters per second or 13.7 kilometers per second. Now, there are two examples of redshift detected in astrophysics. There's cosmological cosmological redshift and stellar redshift. Now, cosmological redshift is redshift detected on distant galaxies, while stellar redshift is redshift detected on nearby stars. Now, cosmological redshift is detected on all galaxies, while stellar redshift is detected on certain stars. Now, the cosmological redshift is proof of the expansion of the universe and further proof of the hot Big Bang model, while stellar redshift allows us to determine the properties about the stars. So we'll look at cosmic redshift in the next lesson, but we're going to look at stellar redshift now. So as well as measuring the redshift of objects moving relative to us, we can use redshift to detect rotational motion. So for example, consider the rotation of a star, which we call stellar redshift. Now when we observe red and blue shift with stars, it's due to, uh, it's due to rotational motion. Now the most common cause of this are binary stars. So this is when two stars orbit around a common center of mass as a pair. So a binary star system is a star system with two stars rotating around a common center of mass. So for example, series A and series B. Now we denote the larger and brighter star as A and the smaller and dimmer star as B. However, how can we make sure that it's a true um, binary system and not a phenomenon caused by optical inaccuracy? All we've got to use redshift is when the two stars are orbited by one another, one will be moving towards us and the other will be moving away from us. Now the star that's observed to be moving towards us is going to be blue shifting, whilst the star observed to be red shifting is moving away from us. So in our line of sight, one star star at one point will pass in front of the other, causing an eclipse. Now a simplified light curve from an eclipse and binary system is shown below. Now the apparent magnitude scale increases going upwards, so the dips in the graph correspond to the light dimming. So in this example, the two stars have different surface temperatures. So you can see that with Stefan's law. Now when the apparent magnitude is 3.30, the system is at its brightest as both stars can be seen. Now the deeper dips are caused by the cooler star passing in front of the hotter star. So the apparent magnitude is 3.60 and the shallower dips are at 3.45 when the hotter star passes in front of the cooler.
Now, if the light from one star is analysed in more detail, the shift in wavelength of one particular spectral line can be measured as the star follows a circular orbit. Now, the peak of the graph occurs when the star is receding from our point of view at its maximum velocity, so the two stars are next to each other. The eclipse occurs when the star is moving at right angles to our line of sight. Now, you can see in this particular uh, diagram that the orbital period of a star is eight days as it repeats itself after eight days. Now, the Doppler equation can then be used to calculate the maximum recession velocity which equates to the orbital speed of the star with the following equation as shown. With the orbital speed and time period the diameter of the orbit can then be calculated using the circular motion equation where we know circumference of a radius is equal to orbital speed times by orbital period. So therefore you can use that to then work out the diameter of the actual orbit. Now in as well as having a binary system you can observe the rotational motion of one star. Now as the part of the star rotates to towards us, we will observe that as blue shifting, whilst as it rotates away from us, we will observe it as red shifting. That's a very important idea, and that's how we can determine properties regarding stellar rotation of that star about its axis. So what have we learned in today's lesson? That change in f over f equals v over c, z equals delta lambda over lambda, but it also equals minus v over c. But this only works with v being a lot smaller than c, and it's in the optical and radio frequencies. And it's to do calculations on binary stars viewed in the plane of orbit. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to understand the Doppler effect, detail examples of redshift found in astrophysics, and then understand and apply the formulae for, for redshift from observations. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on redshift, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.